Hello everyone, welcome to Archie Viking. Today I'm bringing to you uh, the tragic story of uh, a Cherokee uh, statesman in Ned Christie's War, the wrongful execution of a Cherokee statesman. Uh, who was Ned Christie? Well, Ned Christie was a very important individual uh, in the Cherokee Nation in the uh, 1800s, uh, specifically in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, his name was uh, what we call Ned Christie, but his Cherokee name was not a Wade. Um, again, as always, any Cherokee who are watching, please feel free to comment and correct me on any pronunciations I say. Uh, and he uh, grew to prominence through the 1870s and 80s and 90s uh, as a Cherokee statesman uh, and council member and even a advisor to the current uh, principal chief of the Cherokee at the time. Uh, and why the story is important is because, uh, much as the title says, he was eventually uh, framed for a crime he did not commit uh, and executed, um, which is a complete disservice to him. And the fact that this is not as well known outside of uh, certain circles in uh, the history war, you know, the world of historians, as well as in the Cherokee Nation. Um, and that's just wrong, and we need, I aim to fix this. Uh, so, um, Nede Wade was born in 1852 in Willa, uh, Oklahoma, in the Cherokee Nation. Um, and as I said in my last video, uh, at this point in time, the Cherokee Nation uh, was located, and still is, but uh, was located in what was called Indian Territory. Um, Indian Territory being this uh, map you see here, where you have on the right the so-called five civilized tribes um in the cherokee chickasaw choctaw creek uh and seminole um who are only called the civilized tribes because they tried to uh assimilate into american and european culture um and therefore were seen as more civilized than uh say the other half of Oklahoma Indian Territory, where you see the Cheyennes and the Arapahoes, uh, the uh, Osages, uh, and even Comanches and Kiowas. Um, but you know, at the same time, this is also subjective because civilization and civilized is subjective. Um, but needless to say, this is where Ned Christie uh, grew up. Um, and he was born in 1852 uh, and lived all of his life here. Um, and what's important to note uh, is uh, he did actually become very prominent in the Cherokee Nation uh, by becoming an advisor to the uh, chief, uh, principal chief of the Cherokee while also holding a profession of a gunsmith and a blacksmith. Um, so he, he held quite a lot of authority within the Cherokee Nation and was very well respected. Uh, he was also gained prominence uh, by being a member of the Kitwa Society, which was a society that was in stark opposition of an event going on at the time known as the Dawes Act, uh, which is what this uh, cartoon here is depicting. Uh, and the Dawes Act was uh, a, a bill being passed by the U.S. Senate that would give the president authority to divide up uh, in the American Indian lands within Indian territory into specific blocks and allotments. So uh, what this means is they would go from the traditional um, tenements and other uh, various uh, forms of property holding that were uh, original to Cherokee and other American Indian societies and would transfer them forcibly, not willingly, forcibly to uh, more um, capitalistic, more American style uh, property rights. Uh, and this was done so that they would, uh, it would be easier to coerce um, Cherokee and other tribes into selling land because under the provisions of this act uh american indians were allowed to um sell land if they saw fit 
Uh, and in fact, this act would eventually help <laughs> lead into the uh, Homestead Act of the 1890s, in which good chunks, large chunks of Oklahoma were um, sold off to white settlers and only white settlers. Anybody who's seen uh, the Tom Cruise movie Far and Away, um, that's essentially what the movie is about. Uh, and it wasn't just this, they were also opposed to the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad being built uh, through Oklahoma uh, and various other railroads. And so obviously this put Ned Christie, uh, Natty Wadi, um, in opposition with the railroad companies as well as the U.S. government. Um, now, it should be noted he was uh, known for having some pinches of violence, as he did eventually go to court at some point uh, for manslaughter, but he was not charged uh, for it, um, and that is really only hearsay. Uh, but unfortunately, this um, opposition to the railroad system uh, and his prominence in the Cherokee Nation uh, combined with it, because if he had just been in opposition to it and had been a nobody in the Cherokee Nation, it wouldn't have mattered much, but he wasn't a, a direct advisor to the uh, principal chief of the Cherokee and was a prominent member of this Kitawa society. So unfortunately, uh, that did put him into uh, opposition with uh, the aforementioned U.S. government and railroad system. Uh, that was eventually uh, aggravated by the murder of a U.S. Marshal. Uh, the U.S. Marshal was Daniel Maples, uh, Dan Maples for short, and he was found uh, dead uh, from gunshot um, in uh, the late 1880s in Oklahoma. And what had happened is Dan Maples had been uh, in Oklahoma to hunt down illegal uh essentially illegal whiskey trade. He was hunting them down, uh, any smugglers or anyone he could find, uh, specifically a very well-known killer uh, known as Bud Trainer. Um, and eventually uh, he was not able to get Bud Trainer, and he uh, decided to make his way back to Texas uh, and was promptly shot. Um, now, nobody knows for sure who uh, killed him, uh, but it is most definite that it was not Nede Wadi. Uh, and we know this from two specific witnesses um, that, uh, that said uh, one in 1918 uh, who was named, um, let's see here, his, his name was uh, uh, Dick Humphrey, and then there was Darius Ward in 1917, um, and, they, and granted, this was many years after the murder of uh, Daniel Maples, uh, but they both confirmed uh, that Ned Awadi had not killed Dan Maples. Uh, in fact, Darius Ward uh, mentioned he had been the second person to find uh, Maples' body, uh, and that he knew for a fact, having come from the town, that uh, Ned Christie was asleep uh, at the time of the murder of Daniel Maples. Uh, not to mention other witnesses, including uh, Ned Christie's uncle and various other people whom he was with and drinking at the time. So a lot of witnesses uh, were uh, brought forward and did say that it was not uh, Naughty Waddy. Uh, however, um, <laughs> This did not fly with the U.S. Marshals, uh, specifically because at first they were even believed that it was actually Bud Trainer who murdered Dan Maples. But as they were arresting Bud Trainer's associates, uh, essentially one of the associates said that it was actually Ned Christie who killed him, and the Marshals therefore believed a white man uh, over the uh, Cherokee. And this brings us into Judge Isaac Parker, because the case was brought to Judge Isaac Parker, who was a well-known hanging judge. He was known for uh, his so-called hanging judge because he was uh, the kind of judge who would basically 
uh, hang people more than he, uh, he did not. Essentially, he was an execution judge. Now, it should also be noted that that's not all he did. He was for prison reform, and he was even, uh, to a certain degree, pro-American Indian, as he was for reform and of the judge system, justice system in Indian territory to be more favorable. Um, and he did try to reform criminals as well. Uh, but that does not take away that he was very prone to ordering executions. Um, and he took the case uh, and ordered Ned Christie Nadiwadi to come uh, to his uh, court uh, and basically make his case. Uh, however, uh, he did not allow Nadiwadi to get his own uh, evidence to not allow Nadiwadi to defend himself, really. So he's basically just come here without any evidence, without any alibis, without any proof or anything, uh, and be at, the, be at my mercy. Essentially is what happened. Um, and Nelly Wadi, um, understandably, did not think that was a good idea. And so he refused to come uh, and therefore began to uh, hide out. Um, quite a bit. Uh, and then this is a, for a lot of reasons, uh, specifically for the fact that uh, the court system in Indian country uh, was more favorable to whites than it was to American Indians. Um, hence, uh, Isaac Parker wanted to reform it. Uh, but while he wanted to reform it, the fact still of the matter stay, stands that Indian territory was not very good uh, in the court system. So American Indians uh, like Nadiwadi would probably still have been charged. Whether or not Isaac Parker char would have charged him is up for debate, but uh, the fact that he did not give uh, Nadiwadi uh, the ability to bring his own evidence to try and clear his name doesn't really bode well. <clears throat> So, because Natty Wadi uh, refused to come to Isaac Parker, uh, Marshall, U.S. Marshals were sent in. Uh, and this is where the event known as Ned Christie's War starts. Uh, Ned Christie uh, holds himself up with various friends and family in his home in Willow, Oklahoma, uh, and defended himself for years uh, from 1870, uh, sorry, 1889-ish, uh, to 1892 uh, very well. Um, the first of the marshals who was put in charge was Jacob Yoz, the figure here in the bottom. Uh, and he was the overall marshal uh, in charge of apprehending uh, Nadi Wadi. And the person he put in charge of leading the posses while he was uh, stationed in Fort Smith was uh, the individual up here, Heck Thomas. Um, and as I said, uh, these marshals really uh, didn't succeed very much, or sorry, did not succeed at all. Um, at one point, however, Heck Thomas and his uh, posse was able to burn down Nettie Waddy's house, um, but Nettie Waddy wasn't there, neither were any of his friends or family, uh, and Nettie Waddy just uh, promptly came back after Heck Thomas and his posse uh, left and rebuilt the house, uh, and they continued to um, hold back uh, various, uh, essentially, uh, you know, more incursions uh, until Jacob Yos himself had to take charge. Uh, what's interesting is uh, another marshal who didn't actually, or at least as far as any historian can tell, didn't actually have any involvement in the pursuit of Nediwadi, uh, but was rumored to have been uh, pursued, uh, to have been pursuing Nediwadi, was a famous marshal um, known as Bass Reeves, this figure over here uh, on the far right. Uh, Bass Reeves is the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. Uh, he was also black. Uh, and the reasons for this are too long for this video, uh, as Bass Reeves deserves his own video. Uh, but essentially, the rumors are uh, that Bass Reeves, who was known for being the most tenacious, the most uh, determined uh, 
lawman in or uh, around Indian territory, even outside of Indian territory, uh, that it was believed that he was the one who had taken up the wanted poster and that he would get him, uh, get Nadi Wadi, uh, which to be fair, if he had uh, taken, a, uh, taken up uh, the wanted poster with his posse, um, he probably would have gotten Nadi Wadi fairly early. Uh, Bass Reeves never, uh, miss an arrest he had the highest arrest record uh in uh the time period uh, but he did he didn't do it uh, the thing is he probably wasn't even in the area he operated mostly in seminole uh indian territory um uh and he was away pursuing other uh bounty so he probably never even had any involvement but it's interesting uh, that this happened and the reason he is even mentioned is because of something called yellow journalism and dime uh, novels because they were really the reason that the public view of ned christie Nettie wadi was so um skewed at the time uh yellow journalism uh, essentially is you make up a sensational story to get views, to get um, people to buy more newspapers, which is sort of like what the news is now, only uh, there were a lot less reputable newspapers at the time. I mean, there were reputable newspapers, but uh, generally the reputable ones were not the ones who were covering stories like this. It was only the dime novels and yellow journalism. Uh, which is in stark contrast to now, where it's the opposite, where we do have, in our modern time, uh, a bunch of not reputable uh, journals and, uh, and newspapers, but we have actually more reputable than we have not reputable. Um, but uh, I digress. That is the reason uh, these marshals were uh, going after Nettie Wadi a lot of times, because a lot of times they were getting their own information from these yellow uh, journalism newspapers. Um, and a lot of them hadn't even met Nettie Wadi or anything like that, whether it being gunfire or otherwise. Uh, and then it's also why sensational stories like Bass Reeves uh, chasing him existed. Uh, but needless to say, eventually uh, J uh, Jacob Yeo's took control of uh, the posses. And he uh, led the uh, final few sieges on uh, Ned Iwadi's uh, house. Um, and these pictures right here are uh, the area in which Ned Iwadi's house uh, existed. There's the stream on the left that's only 100 yards from Ned Iwadi's uh, house. Uh, and the picture on the right is a picture of where his house originally stood. Um, and it's being shown to people by a uh, descendant of uh, Nede Wadi. Uh, and so these multiple sieges by Jacob Yeo's um, had mixed results a lot of time, much like Hick Thomas's. Um, but eventually Jacob Yeo's and his uh, uh, posse were able to uh, lay siege to uh, Nede Wadi's uh, house uh, and push a wagon full of dynamite up to uh, the house and blow up his house uh, and force Nede Wadi out uh, and shoot him dead. And then at that time, uh, with the death of uh, Nede Wadi, Ned Chrissy's war had ended. And they promptly took Nede Wadi's body uh, and took it uh, to. Uh, I uh, believe uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I could be wrong on that, but uh, he they took uh, Nettie Wadi back to uh, Fort Smith. That's right. They took him back to Fort Smith, Oklahoma, and then posed themselves uh, around his body and took pictures of their victory for killing uh, Nettie Wadi. Uh, in this picture, uh, Nettie Wadi is the figure with the number five under him. He's the figure right here in the middle. Uh, which was, um, I would, I would not even be afraid to say that this is barbaric and should not have been done. Uh, but it was common for the time where after you kill an outlaw, um, 
or in Ned, well, Ned Christie's Nebby Waddy's case, uh, somebody who was not an outlaw who was killed for something he didn't commit, uh, you would often pose yourself like this uh, with the body. Uh, and in many cases, like, uh, for example, the death of Jesse James, uh, your body, their bodies would be put up for display so people could come and get pictures with dead famous outlaws. <clears throat> So uh, now uh, Ned Christie Nettie Waddy uh, permanently resides in the uh, Watt Christie Cemetery um, to this day. But you know, with with his death, uh, one must ask, what what is his legacy? What did he leave behind? Was he ever cleared of his crimes? Was he, is he still thought of uh, by many people as guilty? What what happened? Well, uh, for one thing, he's not thought of as guilty anymore. Uh, the picture on the right uh, is a picture of a plaque actually in Fort Smith uh, to this day um, that uh, states that it clearly was that Nettie Waddy was assassinated, not that he committed the crime, that he was killed for a crime he didn't commit. It is a clear statement of assassination. Um, something that should not have happened. Uh, and this is also alongside a plaque uh, in the court, outside the courthouse of uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. So, uh, and a lot of this came many years later. Unfortunately, he was not clear of his crimes, uh, as I said earlier, until 1917 and uh, 1918 with Darius E. Ward's and Douglas Humphrey's uh, accounts. And one might ask, why did it take so long for them to come forward? Why did they wait until uh, 1918, 1917, when Ned A. Wadi was charged with crimes in 1888, 1889, and was killed in 1892? Well, you have to remember, these were the times of Jim Crow, uh, especially in the 1890s during the high rise of the uh, <laughs> Ku Klux Klan uh, in those areas, um, and various other reasons. So they were understandably terrified to come forward, but they did eventually come forward. Uh, and then in the image to the left is uh, the uh, gravestone of Nate Christie in uh, the uh, uh, Christie uh, Cemetery. Uh, and so to this day, he is now viewed as an example of what horrors could happen to uh, American Indians both then and now. He was somebody who did not murder anybody. He did not murder a marshal, but because he was well known, because he was in direct opposition to the Dawes Act uh, and the Railroad Acts and was a more traditional Cherokee, and because he did have a certain degree of uh, history of violence, he was singled out. And he was singled out because lawmen were more willing to believe a white man, out, you know, a white man who, for one thing, was an outlaw, but uh, a white man over uh, a Cherokee. Uh, and that is something that should not have ever happened um and it's something that we need to learn from and it's something that needs more coverage than it is given uh now um there are history books that i will cite in the sources uh recent history books that talk about this but i mean it's not it's this should be taught in schools uh, i'll put it that way and so uh we have to honor this man and we have to uh remember him because this man uh, was wronged uh, and should never have had this happen to him. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, end the video and be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and I hope you all have a good day.